Hello, everybody. I'm going to get my slides up. Um, I'm Kath, by the way, uh, and Simon's helping out with the tech today. So I'm going to keep an eye on the waiting room and the chat and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to share my slides and I'll take you through. Yeah, welcome to the presentation. There we are. Lovely, I'll make a start. So I think it probably took me about oh, 20 minutes to share some information with you. So welcome, we're talking about social pedagogy and psychological safety with virtual teams. So if you've got any questions, um, yeah, pop them in the chat. I'm sure there'll be an opportunity to answer those and chat with you later when I finish the presentation. If we run out of time, I'll find a way to get some responses to whatever questions you've got. So let me tell you a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Kath Barton. Uh, I work for Community Circles. So we're a tiny charity. We partner with all sorts of different organisations. Um, and I've recently completed my MA in Social Pedagogy Leadership at UCLan in Preston. So the information, the stuff around psychological safety that I'm going to share with you today was part of my innovation project. So, and I'll tell you a little bit of background and you know, what brought me to thinking about that. So community circles, just a little bit of background and uh, sharing what we do. So we help people to do more of whatever matters to them. So that's creating a space for ideas and for conversations, uh, creating those opportunities for connections and relationships to flourish and how we do it. So it's building that individual circle of support around a person. Also thinking about uh, connecting people through shared interests. Uh, so we work in local areas, we partner with different organisations and we probably work with people from birth to end of life over the last 10 years or so. So community circles, so yeah, relationships are absolutely at the heart of all we do. So we often rely on digital means for our work. Um, so when we think about relationships, it's not only for the people that we support, but also thinking about our colleagues, the organisations that we partner with, our team members, you know, the people that we connect with through, well, any, you know, anybody that we're in touch with. Um, a sense of belonging is really high on my own individual values. So having that sense of belonging and meaningful connection is really important to me personally, but also to think about the way we work um, and all the values that underpin community circles and the work that we do. So I'm in Lancashire. So a lot of our work, we have work across the UK. So we're doing some work in Somerset and in Suffolk. We've got work happening in New Zealand and Australia. So often, you know, geography hasn't allowed us to do face-to-face. -face. So we've often relied on digital means using Zoom and Slack. So that's always been of interest that can we create that space of meaningful belonging when we rely on, yeah, digital means to support our relationships. So that was always on my mind, um, even pre-COVID because of the way we work. But then COVID, lockdown restrictions, it made it an even more of a sort of urgent question to think about. So social pedagogy, just thinking about that golden thread. So this is a fabulous quote um, from Gabriel and Sylvia at FEMPRA. So social pedagogy, not merely how individual practitioners should work, it's also how the team, the organisation, the wider system need to function as an interlinked system based on similar principles, philosophies and visions. So yes, yeah, so social pedagogy, it's not just a process to implement or solely an approach for the people we support, but rather an art form. So not a skill to be acquired. It's a social pedagogy is expressed through the professional's how tongue. So yeah, learning about how tongue was a real light bulb moment for me. Um, and I think it's been that golden thread from yeah, my own how tongue and values to think about relationships, to think about that belonging that we have that's yeah, really nudge me interest in psychological safety, really. So I've been thinking, you know, what helps create 
that sense of belonging, what really nourishes fabulous relationships with colleagues, what does that look like? Uh, and especially thinking when we haven't got the opportunity for face-to-face -face stuff. So yeah, learning about psychological safety was really interesting to me. So I read this fabulous book, Fearless Organisation by Amy Edmondson. So psychological safety is creating a space where mutual trust can thrive and people can be honest and caring at the same time. So Amy Emerson describes it as a climate in which people are comfortable expressing and being themselves, confident that they can speak up and won't be humiliated, ignored or blamed. So it's that space to take risks. And I think there's been a real golden thread with social pedagogy, with the concepts you're sort of like thinking about the diamond models when I think about the in being in a leadership role and my supporting colleagues to be the best versions of themselves. Um, you know, are we caring deeply for people because relationships are really important and they matter to us? You know, are we using compassionate communication uh, to be really clear and kind? You know, thinking about that learning zone, are we able to nudge people along into that learning zone where they feel stretchy and comfortable without tipping them into panic. Um, yeah, thinking about the three Ps, thinking about our professional selves, our personal selves, but also our private selves, when we think about bringing our whole selves to work. Um, so get, yeah, psychological safety, it's having those open conversations where we do care deeply, but we challenge directly. And what does that look like? So thinking about psychological safety, so what it is, uh, an open space for reflection, a place for clear and kind conversations. So where mistakes are learning opportunities. So community circles, we set up about 10 years ago with the intention of making circles of support available for everybody. And they weren't available for everybody, they were mostly for people with a learning disability. So we've had lots of learning We've worked with lots of people, but we've not always got it right. But it's always felt that we've been in a really safe place where we can try stuff and it's all right if we get it wrong or we see that as a learning moment. So that feels that we've been really lucky to have that culture where we've been able to do that. But yeah, what did a space where collaboration, where that learning, where that innovation can take place, uh, where we can set really ambitious goals. Um, yeah, and that place for conversation when you want to be really ambitious, but what does that look like? Um, but what it isn't, it's not about being nice. It's not about being nasty either, but it's not just about having nice conversations. So not always a comfortable environment. It's not about avoiding tough conversations. Sometimes tough conversations need to, to happen that benefits all of us, benefits the work that we're doing, the learning opportunities. But it's just checking that we're using, you know, compassionate communication. We're being clear and kind around that. It's not based on personality characteristics. So it's not that um, extroverts have psychological safety because they're confident to speak up. So it should be a space where everybody's included and welcomed and uh, keen to participate. So it's not about reducing standards. It's about, yeah, a space where we can all do our best work. So psychological safety, how would you get it? Mm -hmm. So in, in very true um, social pedagogical way, it depends. It always depends. So and this is a quote from a fabulous book, uh, Reinventing Scale Ups. Um, where Law, Basterfield and Marsley suggest that there's no hard and fast rules. So experimenting with ways to encourage and support interpersonal risk taking is the way to develop psychological safety. The key is being open to trying and learning without the fear of embarrassment or punishment. So one of the risks that we took, it was only a bit, it was only small, it felt, it felt quite daunting at the time, really. I guess on reflection, it felt a bit small. Um, so at the beginning of lockdown last year, when face-to-face -face things uh, had to be put on hold, um, yeah, and that moment of panic where, what are we going to do now? So my colleague Becky suggested we, well, we'll shift everything onto Facebook, we'll set up a Facebook group, we'll shift everything virtually. 
we, we use Zoom, we're comfortable with that, you know, but we thought, will it work? I don't know. Will people engage with that? How can we replicate the great stuff and the relationships um, in a virtual space that we do face to face? So I guess it was a risk, but we, we had a go and yeah, it worked out all right. It's been quite successful. We've had lots of learning, but I guess it's that space where we thought, yeah, we'll give it a go. That feels all right to do that. You know, so we have a try. So I want to share some some things with you, some of the tools and processes that we've used to think about supporting that space of psychological safety and what does that look like. So this is our team plan. So our team plan contains all the information from all our colleagues that are within community circles. But this is just my information because I'm I'm happy to share this bit with you all. So in our team plan, this is what our contents look like. So we have your values. So each colleague does their own individual values. That was a real light bulb for me. It's like having your how tongue recorded, which I love. Um, then we think about blending those values together to think, well, what does our team values look like? And then we think about our purpose and our agreements. Uh, we've got a one page profiles, we think about our work histories. So gathering that really rich information um, about our colleagues, bringing our whole selves to work. Um, yeah, snapshot of who we are, but then using some other tools to dig a bit deeper. So thinking about communication charts and how we best communicate together. Thinking about stress and support. What does that look like? What does that show up like? Uh, what can we do around that? Thinking about giving feedback, because there's lots of things around psychological safety that, yeah, where communication is really clear and kind, but what does that look like when we're thinking about feedback? So these are my individual values. Um, so you've got that belonging right at the top. So yeah, massively important to me personally that I have that sense of belonging, feel those connections with people. Um, and when geography is a challenge and we're working with people the other end of the country or across the other side of the world, still having that is really important. Um, yeah, friendship, expressiveness, all that sort of stuff, listening and trust, all that that really matters to me. And when we've all done our individual uh, values profiles, these are the things that come up as our top 10. Um, with our colleagues and what our values for community circles look like. And it's really interesting, I think, to think we've got lots of relational values, so relating to other people, which was really interesting. The developmental values, so creating that space which doesn't quite exist at the minute. Um, and somebody did mention to me, he said, you've no control values. How on earth do you get things done? And I thought, well, I don't, I'm not sure, but we do. We do get things done, but it is, yeah very important around the relational stuff. So, and then we think about a purpose. What's a, a big picture? What's our aim at Community Circles? What does success look like for us? So absolutely, help people to be healthy, happy, and more connected with the support of the community. And our Circles Connected is where we've been working in local areas to help connect people around shared interests. So we think about loneliness, you know, but we think about connection. How do we support people to connect with each other? Um, opportunities to contribute to find that valued role. Um, yeah, shared interests, conditions for friendship and mutual support. That's all the stuff that we do. So, and it's really important to, that we check in and think, you know, the stuff on my to-do list, the stuff in my diary, the things that I'm doing, is that supporting what our, our overall purpose is? But thinking, then we've got our agreements to each other. So it's that weaving that golden thread between what is our purpose, what our individual values are, how we've gathered a, a, a team values together. And one of them sort of came up to think about when we think about relationships. So to feel safe, safe to be vulnerable and have really honest conversations with each other. Um, yeah, sharing our successes and mistakes with each other. So we have a Slack channel, which is a bit like WhatsApp, but with more functions. Uh, we share, you know, Friday failure, you know, uh, or a win of the week. What does that look like? So how we can celebrate and share our, our successes and our, our failures, our learning moments. Yeah. 
you know, um, knowing that a Zoom calls are a judgment-free space to share ideas. So no matter how small they are, so, so that we can work together to make that our purpose, uh, that reality. Uh, we've got a one page profiles in there. So we think about, you know, the appreciation section, all the things that are important to us and think about bringing the whole selves to work. So stuff that we want to share with the colleagues as well as thinking about, you know, the three P's. And um, yeah, what does good support look like? So thinking, what do my colleagues need to know uh, about the things that work well for me? We've recorded some stuff around work history. So thinking about our previous roles and what I did and, you know, uh, personal stuff when the kids were born, all that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, exploring in previous roles, what's the lessons learned? So we've thought about the things that have worked really well, but also the things that haven't worked so well. Um, you know, the things that have worked, I want those to show up for me every day. The things that haven't worked for me in the past, I don't want to revisit those really. So yeah, acknowledging that is important. So we have a communication chart. Um, yeah, and I think that's really important. I don't really like phone calls. Um, I much prefer a conversation. I prefer that face-to-face. -face. Zoom is all right, yeah. We do great on Zoom. Um, yeah, so I can imagine that if I hadn't shared that information and people were ringing me, there'd be some friction between that relationship. Yeah, I'm not keen on using the phone. So let's, let's, but yeah, send me, let's plan a Zoom together. That'll work much better for me. So, but yeah, sharing that is, is really important. Because if people don't know that and they ring me often, then um, yeah, it's just information that we need to share with each other. Um, thinking about stress and support, yeah, just adding, so when we think about a one-page profile and the snapshot, these are just sort of like extra bits that we might want to share um, to explore a bit deeper about each other. But yes, yeah, things that make me really stressed and how does that show up in my behaviour, in day-to-day -day stuff, but what helps, what can I do, what do my colleagues, what could they help me with, how can they support me around that? Yeah, and giving feedback. And I think feedback has been really important as part of psychological safety. And yeah, it's having that reci reciprocity, I guess, between us, that I ask for feedback as much as I offer feedback and that we can do that with each other. Uh, and community circles, we, we work as a self-managed team. So we all have uh, our own roles and accountabilities. There's no hierarchy. So it's, it's a very different way of working. But yeah, thinking about, yet yeah, that we can give feedback to each other uh, and having that space to be able to do that is important. So, so those are some of the tools and processes that we've sort of used. Um, and there's also a scale that is, it's taken from Amy Edmondson's book, The Fearless Organisation. So these are some of the questions where, and it's on a sliding scale from mostly agree to mostly disagree. So you can sort of answer that within the, so, you know, is it safe to take a risk on the team? Yeah, I mostly agree with that. Or I, yeah, definitely disagree with that. Um, I think it's a bit of a catch 22 completing um, this, this scale around psychological safety. I think if you've got strong psychological safety, people will be very comfortable in answering and completing the scale very honestly. I think if psychological safety is not there already, you might get the responses that people think you are looking for. I don't know. Um, but I have used it, but, and it was really interesting. So the purpose of using it was just to see, where are we? What are we hearing? What do we feel? What's that sense of psychological safety that we've got in the minute at the moment? So yeah, exploring that a little bit. So scores weren't perfect, um, but it was really useful to sort of open up that conversation. So is it safe to take a risk on this team? Well, we're sort of in the middle. People are saying, well, tell me a little bit more about that. 
What would support you to feel more comfortable and confident to take a risk? What are the things that you're thinking about that feel a bit risky? So if having those conversations and just exploring stuff and thinking, you know, um, yeah, working with members of the team, my unique skills and talents are valued and utilised. So when we think about um, going back to our individual values, how are those showing up in work? So one of my colleagues, play and creativity, show really highly on her values. So she has lots of stuff within her work role, thinking about storytelling and graphics and animates and the things that bring her joy in, in her work role. So I guess if somebody scored low on that, so we're not recognising people's unique skills, then we could, have, yeah, let's dig a bit deeper. Yeah, let's find out what are your skills, what brings you joy? How can this show up more in your work role? All that sort of stuff. So, but yeah, in true social pedagogical way, it's not what you do, it's the way that you do it. So the tools, the team plan, the scale, yeah, they've supported us to explore the conversations around psychological safety. I think, yeah, it's how you invite participation. I think it's how we live with values, I think it's how we show our vulnerability. I think it's how I ask for feedback so that asking and giving feedback becomes really natural and our natural way of working. And it doesn't feel that it's your manager that always gives feedback. Um, so yeah, how I ask for feedback. But how I notice when conversations are clear and kind and how I check when they don't feel like that. Um, so, one of the examples, so on a Tuesday, we usually have our weekly team meeting on Zoom and we raise tensions in there as part of our self-management process. So here is where we want to be uh, and here is where we are at the minute. So the gap in between is the tension. So what I need is whatever takes me to, to this bit. So if, if I'm hearing tensions, and I'm hearing people asking for support or sharing ideas or how do we get to that point of success, then that psychological safety feels good, I guess. Yeah, it feels like we have it. We're having really good open conversations. If I'm not hearing tensions from colleagues, maybe I start thinking, are they not comfortable to raise something? Are they not comfortable to ask a question? Does our space of psychological safety not feel that strong at the minute? So I guess it's how we check in, how we notice conversations. Yeah, just being really reflective around what we're seeing and hearing and feeling. So have we got it? Well, so like I said, yeah, it's something we feel. And it can be supported by the structures, by the guides, by the resources. That sort of steer our way of working but it's not a static position it flexes and shifts dependent on the current context and the situation um yeah our roles naturally evolve the work we do naturally evolves you know um yeah we work with people and not kettles and toasters so things change don't they um so i think yeah psychological safety takes effort that way of working that's underpinned by a transparent culture with that regular reflection you know to think about who's participating but who's withdrawing what are the tensions that we might be hearing um yeah what's being heard and felt what does feedback feel like does that feel honest does it feel that people are digging deep enough and sharing what's on demand. So how do we know that we have psychological safety? Yeah, what can we see, feel, or hear? So I guess it is thinking about um, the knowledge that conversations are clear and kind. So we're hearing stuff that, yeah, thinking about the learning zone that shifts us into the, a bit of that stretchy place where we learn things. That communication is open and honest. So without that evidence of hierarchy, because like I said, we, we self-manage, but yeah, that space where we feel, re yeah, where we can be vulnerable, but we feel really safe to do that, that we feel safe to take a risk, that it feels okay, that, yeah, we're trying something new. It feels a bit scary, but I have my 
your tribe around me, I guess. Um, yeah, having questions that sort of stretch and challenge us uh, and thinking about that. So has anybody got any questions? I'm curious to think, is there anything in chat or do you want to take yourselves off mute and ask something or, or pop it in the chat and we'll see what, what you're all thinking. Um, maybe it's easier if you stop sharing so we can all see each other. I can do that, of course, yeah. And then there's a first question in the chat. How can we practice this with shy child with a shy child? Yeah. Wow. Um I guess it's thinking about, yeah, social pedagogy and how we walk alongside people. Um yeah, what is that space for that? for that child where they feel comfortable and confident how can we be alongside them um i'm guessing that all oh, those things around that common third activity that's popping up how can we create that environment where i guess it would where we learn things together so there's not that hierarchy of you know teacher student or you know we're in that space where we learn together um does that support a place of psychological safety where we feel able to open up. Yeah. I'm curious to know what anybody else might think. Frank, you've uh, got your hand. Hey, Frank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, in respect of uh, a young, shy child or a shy young person or adult, for that matter, uh, it's sometimes a good idea to walk behind not necessarily alongside, but let them take the lead, let them show the way. And if it means you showing a vulnerability, all the better, because it encourages the person, the young child to think, well, I'm perhaps in front of this person, you know, I can show them something. And you create that sort of space that builds confidence and self-esteem in that shy person or adult, whichever it might be. Yeah, no, you can disagree, it's okay. Yeah, you know. <laughs> no, no, I think that's great. I often talk about walking alongside people and I often talk about not leaping to fix people, but just creating a space where we can be a sidekick and explore, help people explore their own path. But I think that's a fabulous, Thing to walk behind people. I'm going to, I might borrow that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, walking behind people. Yeah, lovely. Anybody else got any thoughts? Any questions? Anything that you're pondering Please about? Raise hand up. Oh, hello. Hello. Sorry, Morris. I didn't see you with your hand up there. Hi, Cass. Um, on the subject of organizational um, aversion to risk. Um, or my own background would be in residential care in Ireland. And you, you would have historically, you know, through all the different scandals that have happened over the past couple of decades, you would have organisational aversion to risk, which is hard to overcome if you want to, you know, show a little bit more creativity. Uh, you have to give a little bit of autonomy. And, and, you know, with that comes responsibility, of course, as well, and accountability. But um, have you encountered that yourself? Yeah, we talk about risk lots. Um, and I guess with community circles, we talk about, yeah, people living the life of their choosing and how do we support that? Always keeping the person at the centre, exploring what really matters to them. And I think risk comes up a lot of times and we're always really draw it back to what matters to the person. But it's a very holistic approach. So always thinks about, you know, the people in the person's life, family, friends, neighbours. We're really conscious that sometimes the only people in somebody's life are people who are paid to be with them, but we start where people are. And we don't have a, um, a sweeping statement around risk. It's really focusing on that person. A life without risk is a life without opportunity. But how do we... So I guess it's thinking about that gap in we want to be there and we're here at the minute, 
but what nudges it to there? You know, because we don't want to go to there already because that feels really scary and overwhelming. But what are the little steps? And I guess, so within a circle, we always think that that's, or we always try to build that circle as a space of psychological safety where those com conversations can be really deep and meaningful and open and honest, but where people can say, Crack, I'm frightened to death of this. I know you want to, that's where you want to be, but yeah, frightened to death. Um, well, let's, let's explore that a bit more. Tell me a bit more about that. What does that feel like? Yeah, and every situation is really, you know, yeah, people are not kettles and toasters, so nothing's predictable and everything's really unique. But I guess that's where we have to start with the conversation. What does that look like? Did that answer your question? It did, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Anybody else got any? Oh, we've got another hand up. Bye, hello, hello. Hi, Kath. Just wanted to ask you, you know, you've got the community circle, the team plan. Mm -hmm. Are people open to sharing some personal things? Uh, I just wondered how yes. it was. Yeah. Um, yes, they were, because that's how we work. Mm. And I think right from um, recruitment, right from advertising a role and thinking about recruitment, that's the stuff that we share. Um, that's the stuff that we ask people and we ask that for a really good reason because relationships matter because we want to know yes. people we want people to come and use the gifts and the passions and things that they're interested in and it's not just for the people that we support it's it, this is how we work together but I remember thinking yeah a few years ago when I worked with a different organization feeling really excited around person-centered thinking to us. And yeah, I thought a one page profile was fabulous. I was sharing that. And, and I, I went to visit a team and the, the manager had asked me to come and talk about one page profiles for the team because we wanted to think about the purpose was around matching people up well with the shared interests. Um, thinking about that team building, thinking about good communication, all that sort of stuff. And I was in a room with about 20 members of staff and everyone went, what do you want to know about me for? <laughs> and I remember that really clearly. Um, and I think, so we've obviously learned lots. So we think about the three Ps and we think, well, this is the professional me. This is the personal me. So this is the stuff that I'm happy to share because it brings my whole self to work. But this is my private stuff and I'm only sharing that with my you know, my small gathering of people that love me, you know. Um, so I think there's a really clear purpose for the information that we we ask from people and that we ask people to share. And it's, um, yeah, it's to help people have more joy at work. It's to help people be matched up well. Um, yeah, so hopefully, so it might be brand new to people. But I think once they understand the reasons for it, you know, and, and we do that. So we we try, we do, I guess we don't always get it right. But thinking about that walk in the walk, are we doing what we say we do? So, yeah, sharing that sort of stuff. Um, I couldn't imagine going to meet somebody that maybe I'm going to be supporting, walking alongside, walking behind, you know, without sharing a bit of me, you know, because it needs to be that. I don't want there to be any imbalance of power, you know. Um, so, yeah, so I would always share my one-page profile. But I guess if I do, I do it, but I, but I expect colleagues to do it, you know, that is how we do stuff. So, yeah, um, but I guess that that's different in different places where the culture doesn't feel as open, maybe. And I guess it's so, sometimes it's just doing little bits, little bits. Um, yeah. I really, really like it because I feel as if um, that's when you can really form relationships, bonds, and just have that growth, you know, personal as well as the community that you're in. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I remember um, during quite early on in lockdown, our team meetings used to be on a Friday morning. And um 
So the swimming pools are closed, everything had closed, and little little things were opening in some areas, and it wasn't the same. In Lancashire, it was in Birmingham, you know, there were lots of differences going on. But Becky, one of my colleagues, said, um, can we change a team meeting to a different day? I've got the chance to go swimming on a Friday morning. It's the only slot I can get booked in. And it felt really important about, mm. you know, Becky's well-being, about time with the mum, around exercise, around, you know, and she just felt really comfortable to say, can we change it? I don't want to meet on a Friday anymore. I want to go swimming. So, yes, yeah, so we've, we've changed it to a Tuesday. And we've just kept it at a Tuesday because that works for everybody. Wow. Yes, yeah, swimming matters. <laughs> Yeah. Has anybody else got any other questions? Yeah, I was going to ask. Well, oh, Sam, go on. Yeah. Quick one. So I love, I love the sort of model, the list you had at the beginning with the values and all the different lists of stuff. And I was just, because I manage a team of 10 practitioners over 10 local authorities. So there's something I was just going to ask you directly. Did you make it up as you go along or are you following a path or did you add little bits? Because I find that I'm doing a little bit here and a little bit there, whereas this seems really sort of um, clear and structured. And I just wondered how you brought those ideas together because they're all lovely. I get, well, I, I work with Helen Sanderson. So I get lots of learning from Helen and uh, the things that they've been doing around wellbeing teams and Helen Sanderson Associates. So lots of the stuff is what's Helen's tried that I think that sounds great and I'll have a go at that. Um, <laughs> and Helen's our chief exec uh, of community circles as well. As. So, yes, yeah, so a lots of involvement. And sometimes it comes up that, um, yeah, I guess we have, we have a, you know, a team plan. We've sort of copied what Helen has done and what that's looked like and, they're learning that it works great. And then maybe we'll add something in because maybe we'll recognise that um, oh, we're learning that Kath really doesn't like phone calls. So maybe we need to add something in around um, how we best communicate together and what does that look like. And I guess when we raise attention, um, yeah, I'm hoping people would feel that they could raise attention about anything. So maybe that will influence what else goes in our team plan. You know, are there any other decisions that we make as a team together? I don't, I don't know. I'd have to ask them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's borrowing the learning and then sort of reflecting on what we see what, and what we need to know about each other, I think. Yeah. Just to let you know, we have five more minutes. So I did wonder... But I, were, I ended up being more interested in your questions and conversations. So I'd, I were wondering whether sending you to breakout rooms, maybe two or three of you, just to think about, I don't know, any questions or any wondering, but is there, was there a tool, was there a process that you think, you know, oh, I'm quite interested in psychological safety, I might try this first. I don't know. We haven't got time to go to breakout rooms, but I'm curious to ask the question, if you were thinking about it, is there anything that you'd, you'd try first or, or curious to know? I think a good place to start is the one page profile, isn't it? Mm. Because you can pick on that how much of you you want to share mm. initially with your team and you can expand on those, can't you? And, and grow them over time and learn to be a little bit safer in your team, perhaps. Um, yeah. so for me I think that's a good one to start with yeah yeah it's a great idea yeah and I think you do share more stuff or different stuff all the time but I think yeah thinking about the purpose of your one page profile is important you know who's the audience who are you going to share it with what's the it, purpose of what you're sharing you know it, it reminds me of something we um uh, social pedagogical organizations to here in Germany, they, they, they write a concept of, about how they want to work. And they review that regularly and the whole staff group comes together and basically develops their philosophy of how they want to present themselves to others and what is their, their working, their Halto philosophy ethos. Ah, oh, that's that interesting. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So I'm conscious, have we just got a couple of minutes? 
Simon, is that right? So what will happen, I guess, in the next two minutes, the countdown will start, which is 120 seconds. And then after that, we automatically go back to the main room. So we probably have, yeah, like two, three, four more minutes. Yeah. Any any other questions or any any thoughts? Frank, you're on mute, but I can see you in Natterin. Uh, have you ever encountered a situation where one of the people, one of the members of the team refuses to cooperate or refuses to buy into the idea of the psychological safety? Not with my immediate colleagues, but then we partner with lots of organisations. Um, and oh, Yeah. Do you uh, how, work how, with, yeah. how do you deal with that? How do you... I guess it's resolve yeah, it. just understanding people. Yeah. Um, yeah, what 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 are the concerns? What's the history? What are they thinking about? You know, we try working in that social pedagogical way that we think, well, what what's what's going on for you? What what does that feel like? I really love psychological safety. It makes loads of sense to me. Um, yeah, all my person-centered approaches, it makes loads of sense to me. It's the way I want to work. But yeah, not everybody's the same as me. Um, so yes, yeah, so we need to have them conversations. Um, yeah, and explore that a bit deeper. What's, what's going on for people that it feels anxious? And I guess thinking about... Um, you know, that example I shared about one-page profiles before when people said, what do you need to know about me for? It felt to them, I thought I'm going in selling a great idea, but it felt really intrusive to people. It was like blurring that work and home yeah, boundary true. and that felt really uncomfortable to them. So I needed to learn a bit more about that before people, yeah, we could have a bit more conversation. I think, Kat, it's, it's good to get um, comfortable with being uncomfortable. You know, to, to protect the dissenting voice in the group because other, if too many people are in agreement, you should be a little bit suspicious we've got a blind spot or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I love that phrase from Brenny Brown when she said, the story I'm telling myself is, and then sharing that bit, because that might be what you're thinking. It might not be what your colleagues, your team are thinking. You might have got it completely wrong, but I like it when you say, well, the story I'm telling myself is... Yeah. Mm -hmm.